Hi, my name is Céline Morin, and I'm delighted to be sharing this time with you discussing the topic of beyond burnout, very relevant indeed. And no matter where you are on the spectrum from stressed to potential burnout, I hope that you'll make yourself comfortable um, sit back, don't get too comfortable because I'm going to ask you to be practically involved and keep the session quite engaging so that it's not just me talking at you because as we know, we are all the experts of ourselves. I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of experience and I get to practice this work every day and it's also my passion to help enrich the lives of people so that we can collectively have happier, healthier communities. So on that note, I would like to give thanks to Realize Potential for the opportunity to be able to do this presentation. And I'm hoping that you will learn something and walk away with at least one thing that you could do differently to help you better manage your energy and avoid the potential of burnout or reclaim control and feel more calm if potentially you are feeling that. So I've got quite a buffet planned and I've got a large menu, but I don't want you to leave with indigestion. So sit back and enjoy. At various points, I'm going to ask you to reflect on things. And then at the end, I'm going to ask you to think of what is one personal pledge? What is one thing that you are going to take and put into practice into your life and your routine so that this time that you've invested is really worthwhile? That is the key. Now, when we talk about well-being, we speak about different dimensions. I speak about these four dimensions. So we have our physical well-being, which is about our body. That relates to um, how we eat, how we move, how we sleep, our health numbers like cholesterol and our blood pressure. And then we've also got our heart, our emotional well-being. And that relates to our ability to recognize our emotions, to be able to talk and connect with others. It's also emotional intelligence, so understanding when you're stressed and having techniques to help and then we have our mental or our mind or intellectual well-being, which is all about oh, this universe that sits on top of our shoulders and getting the most of it, helping it stay creative, keep big picture thinking, having a sense of humor. And then we also have the dimension of a spirit or meaning. It can be a faith or a belief or a religion. It can also be feeling like you're part of something bigger, part of a community, and that your life has meaning. Now, if we were together live, I would ask you at this point to tell me which of these four dimensions do you feel strongest in today? Now, these can change, right? Because last night, maybe you had a great night's sleep, you were well hydrated, you ate well, you even managed to exercise. So like you're feeling amazing, but maybe you've got a lot on your mind or perhaps you had an argument with a loved one. So you're not feeling that great in terms of your emotional well-being. But let's, before we move on, take a moment to recognize where are you feeling strong and competent in, if you were to choose just one? And is there a particular dimension that you would like to feel stronger in? Because maybe that can be where you look out for a lovely tip from today's discussion. Now, as I mentioned, these are all important. However, if I had to stack these on top of each other, this is how you get the best return on investment. Look after your physical well-being. So make sure your body is as well as it can be. And I'm going to go through some fundamentals and share with you a framework at the end that if you'd like to have access to, you can do that. Because when your physical well-being is strong, it's easier for you to show up at your best emotionally and mentally and also then find meaning, right? Because it's hard to regulate your emotions or to think clearly when you're sleep deprived or dehydrated. And if you think of this pyramid, or if you look at it, it makes me think of how I was brought up. So you're, you're going to find out a little bit about me. Uh, I was brought up with parents who would pour champagne. Now, uh, I believe you have an award-winning champagne. C'est très bien. Super. Santé. <laughs> My parents are from the Champagne region in France. If you're curious about why I don't sound French, it's because they left France on honeymoon. And they went to South Africa on their way to Australia but they never got to Australia and they're still in South Africa. They've been there for 52 years. <laughs> so of course I was brought up with the French approach to food and joie de vivre and champagne. And my parents would pour champagne just like that. They would stack the glasses as a tower, pour it in the top and it would overflow into the others. The glasses, by the way, were always put out on a tray and my mother would collect all the champagne and pour it into her glass from the tray. So there was no spillage or wastage. Why I share this with you is because what we're talking about today 
Yes, it can help you enrich the quality of your life. How does it do that? Because it's going to help you at the most basic level to manage your energy. And when we have lots of energy, when you earn the title CEO, and that means chief energy officer, when you can mobilize energy on demand, I mean, you can move mountains, right? However, when you're tired, when you're potentially burnt out, exhausted or highly stressed, then everything feels like a mountain. So we're going to look at how you can try and make sure that you keep your own effervescence so that you stay bubbly and sparkling. But most importantly, so that you can be the one at the top, that you can overflow and impact those and influence those around you. So that collectively we can help sustain a healthier, happier, more effervescent community. Not just here within the organization, but at home with our loved ones and with our local and greater communities. So as I mentioned, my parents left the Champagne region in France. That's a picture of Champagne. They went to South Africa. And at various points in my life, there were um, lovely, long, luscious meals and also Champagne. Um, I'm holding there my little Yorkie above me. <laughs> That's um, Clicquot, named after one of my favorite Champagnes. Sadly, I haven't seen him in a long time because he's in South Africa with my parents. And so I know we all have these personal stories of um, the hardship that we've experienced. However, we can't always change what's happening around us. What we can do is not give up our health while we're building wealth. So we're going to take a look at how you can ensure that your well-being is as well as it can be. And it starts off with being able to identify when you're not well. When you start to move down potentially that spectrum towards getting sick or having mental health issues or not being able to sleep or at the final point, burnout syndrome. So this is a photograph that I took the last time I was in South Africa, November 9, 2019. And why I took it was you can clearly see that at the end of the vines, there are rose bushes. Now, some of you may know why they're there. There's two reasons why the rose bushes are put there. But for today, we'll just take a look at one reason. The roses will be affected by a mildew or a certain bug or aphid before the vine will. So it acts as an alarm system, as a red flag, so to speak, for the vineyard manager to know, hey, something's wrong with my roses. I need to be very proactive here. Otherwise, I could lose the whole crop. So my question to you is, do you know what your alarm bells are? What are your red flags? How do you know when your roses are potentially being affected? And that means that your immune system is at risk or your emotional, mental, and physical well-being is at risk. Now, this can be quite different for all of us. But generally, when most of us are under a lot of stress, because some stress is good, right? We need stress to get out of bed in the mornings, to get work done. You need a little bit of motivation and stress just to listen to this presentation. <laughs> However, too much stress for too long is what's bad. And that's what we're seeing now because of the global pandemic and the longevity of it. And the fact that we don't really have a finish line in sight. Chronic stress uh, releases loads of hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, which are not good for your system. So one place that we can take a look at to see how you're doing in terms of the stress response is to look at your breath. Because most of us, when we get pulled into the stress response, what happens is our heart rates increase to prepare us to deal with the stress or to run away from it. You may have heard of the fight, flight, freeze or fold response. Um, so... Our heart rate increases, our blood pressure goes up, blood flow circulates, and to do that, you take more shallow breaths. So I'm going to invite you now. This is where I need you to assist me. I'm going to set my timer for one minute, and over the next 60 seconds, I would like you to count how many breath cycles you take. So a breath cycle is an inhale and an exhale. One. Two. All right? Don't change your breath because there's no right or wrong here. This is awareness of how you are in this moment. So are you ready? Three, two, one. Bring your awareness to your chest, to your sternum, to your heart. Notice your breath and count how many breath cycles you take over the next minute.
If your mind has wandered without judgment or criticism, gently bring it back to the breath. There we go. That's a minute. Now I'm really curious to know how many breath cycles did you take in that minute? Generally when I do this exercise and I ask the question it can vary from sometimes as low as 8 to sometimes as high as 27. The recommendation is to take between 6 to 8 breath cycles in a minute. So if you were in the single dead digits amazing you're probably breathing quite deeply and slowly if you were like most people double digits maybe even over 20 don't panic <laughs> this is a wonderful sign that potentially you're not using your full lung capacity because your body could be feeling stressed part of that stress response is also to contract and constrict um, and so by ah, breathing in a bit deeper on your inhale and lengthening your exhale you allow not only your internal chemistry to relax, you literally can't feel stressed on the inside or get pulled into the fight or flight response if you're breathing slowly and deeply for six to eight breath cycles a minute. So don't take my word for it. You've got to try this. I am, when I felt particularly stressed and I slowed down my breath, the stress is still there, yes. However, I don't feel as stressed and anxious which means my blood pressure stays normal, my digestion still keeps going on, rest and digest and healing take place, my immune system is still strong, and most importantly, my brain still functions. Because part of the stress response, when we are particularly stressed, we can have what I call a lizard, hijack, wizard moment. The limbic part of the brain, uh, where the stress response comes from, the amygdala, can go into, does go into overdrive. That's what drives you to, to start panicking or thinking about running or attacking and it can override the front of the brain, which is where creative thought and problem solving and big picture thinking sits. So huge benefits. If this is the one thing you take from our time together, amazing. That your breath can A, tell you if potentially you're not sitting upright, if you're particularly stressed or constricted. And by slowing down your breaths, breathing a little deeper on your inhale, even if it's just one centimeter lower, slightly lower into your belly, or lengthening your exhale by a second or two, that's a great place to start in terms of helping to reduce the impact of stress. So this mindful minute can be something that you can do any time of day, almost anywhere. I often do it while I'm waiting for the kettle to boil. Because if we don't do something about stress, if it goes on and on, what can eventually happen is we can start having very negative things. So, you know, we speak about burnout as if it's one thing. It's not one thing. It really is a spectrum. And I've got an example here. Since we're speaking about burnout, I have a candle. <laughs> and let me use, I think this candle might be better. Yeah. Now, when we've been potentially living as if we're on fire for various reasons, because of the stress that we're under, because of pressure, because of personal circumstances, because of uncertainty, um, if we just stop, like if I blow that out, you can see there's loads of smoke and it may not be that pleasant and it might, might smell a bit acrid. So if you really feel that you are potentially at your edges and truly stressed, um, stretched and stressed, don't try to do this alone because it's a bit like putting out a fire. There will be smoke. It might be uncomfortable. It won't be easy. Um, reach out to somebody, a health practitioner that can guide you through this because it didn't just happen overnight. So you're not just going to bounce back after having one weekend off and having a few bubble baths. You know, burnout is about understanding your personal patterns and boundaries and being compassionate with yourself and kind um, because you've acted in those ways to serve a certain purpose, right? So there's a spectrum. One of the signs that you might be reaching burnout, this is a definition according to the World Health Organization, is we start feeling ineffective, we start feeling cynical and we definitely feel exhaustion. 
So ineffective means that we, we just feel like we're not getting anywhere in our work or things take you twice as long or perhaps you make mistakes or you notice that you your memory is not quite the same. Um, and then cynicism is this concept of not finding pleasure anymore in things that you used to find pleasure with. It's also often a sign of burnout is withdrawing. So not wanting to socialize or be with people um, and losing your delight in life. And then, of course, there's the exhaustion that can be, you know, a 10 out of 10 for some people, a 5 out of 10. It can be physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, mental exhaustion. So what we're going to take a look at, we're not going to keep diving into what burnout is. I think we all understand long-term stress. We're going to look at solutions. Let's make this practical. And what we're going to do is take a look at how we, how can we move from, now, I, I made this up because I use acronyms to remember things. So hopefully this could help you. The first three letters of ineffectiveness, cynicism, and exhaustion make up ICE, I-C-E. So I was like, okay, I don't want to be ineffective or cynical or exhausted. I'd rather like to be inspired, um, curious, and energized. So we're going to move towards those three things, and I'm going to share some ideas of how you can do that. But at this point, this is where you get to reflect and to think and ink. Hopefully you have pen and paper because we always think we're going to remember things in the moment because we're motivated and then who knows what happens after this and then you forget. So here's your chance. You're here now, hopefully not multitasking. Um, I'd like you to think about right now in this moment, what is inspiring you? What inspires you? And what are you curious about? And how is your energy? If you don't have quick answers to one or all three of those, then this could be an opportunity to think about how could you bring in some inspiration into your daily life? Even if it is something small and easy, I'll share some ideas. Um, and how can you bring in curiosity? Curiosity is important because it helps us keep a growth mindset, helps us stay open to solutions that we might not have thought of. It helps us also stay playful and childlike. And then energy is important that because when we have energy, like I said at the start, we feel like we can do so much. It's when we don't have energy that everything feels like just too much. Um, so on the note of energy, I often think of ourselves as we really are energy systems. So we're like, there's two examples that you can use. I like the battery analogy, a bit like our cell phones and our devices. We need to be charged up. And when we are fully charged, you get maximum out of us, right? So when we're fully charged and energetic, great. But through the day, we have, you know, a little discharge here and we have a drain over there and discharge. And so at the end of the day or before that, we could feel quite drained. So we need to plug ourselves in and find ways to microcharge. Another example that's quite popular is this concept of the bucket. So when your bucket is full, that's great. But if you only take things out, like you're working and there's a bit of stress, if you don't put back into your bucket, you can eventually get to a point of being empty, just like you can get an empty battery. So if we want to manage the way we feel inspired, whether we feel curious, whether we have energy, one of the basic places to start is to allow ourselves the right kind of rest. Now to do this, we're going to use the intelligence of the seasons, because nature really does teach us a lot. And we have four seasons. So we have spring, summer, autumn or fall, and then winter. And if we were to overlap the seasons onto a 24-hour period, spring would be the time of day when you, when you just open your eyes and you become conscious. And summer will start once you let the outside world in. By that I mean the moment you engage with your phone, and you look at you know WhatsApps or Telegram, or you look at emails off your computer, or you engage with the news, you put the telly on, but you allow the outside world in in such a way that it could cause you to feel stressed. So you might start releasing adrenaline and perhaps even cortisol. So that is um, when summer starts. And then of course we all do summer well. I mean, we know how to be busy, right? <laughs> um, and now with remote working, what is happening is at the end of the day, where we should have an autumn, where we should have this transition, it's so hard. Like that line is blurred, right? Because for many of us, we're not in the office yet. So we don't have the rituals and the transitions like we used to have. We would say bye to colleagues. We would 
uh, walk out the office, we would take um, commute, we would drive ourselves, we would maybe go past the pub or the gym or the grocery store, and then we would walk through the front door and we would greet family and pets, and there would be lots of things that would indicate to us that we were leaving work and we were going into another part of our evenings, but now we're not doing that. We sometimes work in the living room and go back to the living room um, and we don't have these demarcations. So that's why a lot of us, when it comes to winter, and winter is when you get into bed and you almost want to hibernate and fall asleep, that we can't, even though we're tired. We're like so wired that we can't get to sleep. I know what that's like because I am a recovering um, insomniac. And some of us might wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to go back to sleep. So let's take a look at these different times of day because when we're wanting to manage burnout, manage our energy, manage our performance, reclaim um, inspiration and curiosity and energy, it's not just about the eight hours that we sleep at night. So we should be getting eight hours, give or take an hour for most of us. Um, it's about how we start our day. It's about how we, we approach our day and the permission we give ourselves, not just for self-care, but for doing things outside of work. So let's start with spring. Let's take a look at that beautiful, precious time. That is the morning when you wake up and before you actually start work. So think of, think of this morning. I'd like to know how long was your spring? So think of when you woke up, perhaps it was with an alarm by yourself, a barking dog, in my case, a neighbor that slams his door. Um, when you woke up, how long was it before you engaged with the news, social media, work, or friends through messaging and tech texting? Was it one minute? <laughs> was it 15 minutes? Did you make a cup of tea before you did that? Was it maybe half an hour? Maybe it was an hour. Whatever it was, how could you stay curious about lengthening that time because the longer you create a window where you don't have adrenaline and extra potential reactiveness or other people's agendas or fires to put out, the more you're able to stay in what we call the rest and digest mode. So when we start getting pulled into the stress response, we go into what we call the sympathetic hyperarousal. Big words, not important to understand, but we start feeling quite um, alerted and energized and if that was once or twice a day it would be okay but it's not happening like that it's once or twice an hour all the time and so the longer we can give ourselves time to connect with ourselves I mean do you greet yourself before you greet your phone do you even check in and say oh I wonder how I am today many of us don't and if you are doing this outstanding amazing because when we wake up in the morning it's also a time where the subconscious mind and the conscious mind are very open to each other. So it's a lovely time to do mindfulness or meditation or gentle stretching or spend time in nature. Think about do you have meaning in life or just arrive and plan how you want to show up for the day. Give, don't take my word for this. Give this a try. If this is something that you don't generally do and you're one of those people that grabs your phone straight away, how about for five days you try not doing it? It might be a bit uncomfortable. Remember, like I said, when you blow out the candle, there might be a bit of smoke and it might be, yeah, not something that you're used to, but you may be surprised at how it makes you feel motivated and have control for the day. And it can be as simple as starting off with making yourself a cup of tea and drinking the tea while you look out the window or listen to the birds and then engage with the outside world. And chances are you won't have dropped any big balls. You'll be okay. Because before you know it, <laughs> you will get pulled into summer and you'll be productive and working and busy, busy, busy. But you know that even busy bees stop and pause. So during your day, could you do, for instance, the mindful minute, mid-morning and mid-afternoon? While you're going to get a cup of tea or coffee, notice how your breathing is. Are you breathing six or eight breath cycles a minute or is it double or triple that? And certainly in the middle of your day, are you allowing yourself the opportunity to at least stop and have a 10 minute lunch? I mean, a lot of us just work right through. We end up having snack accidents because we're not grounded and present. So how can we be grounded and present and why? I mean, why is this important? Because when you're in the moment, you're more productive, you're more creative, and it's better for your health and well-being. Most of us spend a lot of time in the future or in the past which aren't real at all. 
So an exercise that can help you in the moment, even while you're working, right now we can do this exercise, is to bring to mind your senses. So like that little boy is looking at the pink flowers, you can see he's really being attentive at them, he's smelling them. Could you, could you engage your senses? This is an exercise that I love to do. It's called the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So we start with five things that you can see. So right now, don't look at me. Look away from the screen, which is a very good thing, by the way. Um, we're about to go into the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, but I've just thought of another tool that I wanted to share with you, which is the 20, 20, 20 rule. Every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away from your screen for 20 seconds. That is just to help avoid eye strain and also give you just a visual break. So now's a good opportunity to do that. Look away from your screen, 20 feet away um, for 20 seconds. And what we're going to do is look at five things around you. So just notice any five things around you. It might be a card, a book, the color of the curtains, color of the floor. <laughs> Notice five things that you can see. Then I'd like you to notice four things that you can feel. So I can feel this fabric on my skin. I can feel the floor beneath my feet. I'm standing and presenting. You might be seated. So can you feel the chair beneath your lower back supporting you? Can you reach out and touch something that looks smooth and something that looks textured? And if you're thinking this is woo-woo, the reason why we're doing this is because when you're touching something and you're noticing that it's cold or it's warm or you're seeing something, you're in this present moment because you can't see or touch something in the future or in the past. Now we're on to three things that you can hear. So you can hear my voice, but what else can you hear? What can you hear outside of the space that you're in? Let's move outside. I just heard a car come up the, the road. You might hear a barking dog. Then two things that you can smell. And this is, because we have two nostrils, this is your invitation to take two deep breaths. So breathe in deeply. And as you breathe out, allow your shoulders to drop towards the ground. I hold a lot of tension in my jaw. So I relax my tongue to the bottom of my mouth and that helps. And one more deep breath in. And out. And the last sense, you guessed it, yeah, taste or your mouth. So are you dehydrated? Do you need a little sip of water? Um, maybe you can taste a little bit of residual coffee if you're watching this and drinking a warm drink. So that is a simple exercise and you can use one or all five of the senses. The trick is, I know, we don't do this stuff if we're not reminded because common knowledge is not always common practice. So I got the mindful minute ingrained as a habit because I had a little sticker on my laptop and I also put a post-it note on my kettle and so I probably had the notes there for about two weeks to remind me so every time I put the kettle on I would do a mindful minute and when I saw the sticker it would be um, a cue or a trigger or an anchor for me to take a deep breath and you know what the benefit has been over the last year and a half or so because I'm breathing deeply and relaxing my jaw I don't get headaches anymore I used to get headaches a lot. I sometimes would even get a migraine. I don't know if that was because of clenching my jaw. Uh, it could have been because of screen exposure and stuff. But I haven't. I don't get them anymore. So the key is in consistency, right? So consistency over intensity. Um, think of ways that you can anchor these into your life and then practice them and see if you can feel the benefit. So during our day, we output a lot. And a lot of research is showing that ideally we should work in maximum 90 minute cycles before having a break. Some people use the Pomodoro effect, so they work for 25 minutes and take a five minute break. I find that I can work for almost an hour and then I need to just step away from my screen, stretch, move around, maybe hydrate and then come back and I'm more productive. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you want to go and lie down and have a break, listen to your body. Remember, you are your own expert. Do not keep pushing through boundaries of fatigue because at one point you won't be able to and you will snap. It'll be too much. It's normal to have high energy on one day and low energy on another day. As I've said before, stay compassionate. 
um, and playful. And if you really find that your energy lingers for ages, like you're sleeping more than nine hours a night and you're still not waking up feeling energized, please speak to a health practitioner just to find out if there's not like an underlying chemical or nutrient deficiency or something like that. Then at the end of your workday, have you got an autumn, a transition into your evening to help you relax? And by that, I mean at least an hour, ideally two hours where you are not working, where you are doing either creative work, um, thinking of things that inspire you, connecting with loved ones, using curiosity to drive new behaviors, like learning things, like I want, I'm wanting to um, improve my French. So what I've been doing, because I can't travel to France and see my family, is I'm reading out aloud from some French books. And I'll do that for 15 or 20 minutes. The other thing I've discovered is uh, jigsaws and puzzles. And I just started something two weeks ago. Um, it's called Paint by, Di Paint by Diamonds. A friend bought me this canvas and you get to stick little, it's so addictive. What I've done is I've, I've actually got it next to me in my office. And when I'm feeling stuck or tired, I will maybe go and just do that for five or 10 minutes. It's definitely helped me because um, I've had a really busy week this week. And I'm surprised how my energy levels are quite high. And I'm sure it's because I've been taking breaks because I'm very excited about how the picture will look. And then if you're struggling to sleep, to fall asleep, it is very important to think about if you think of the five senses, so we just went through them, right? We went through sight and smell and taste and feel. Starting with sight, light, very bright lights in our homes will reduce the amount of melatonin that is produced in the brain. And we need melatonin to feel drowsy, to have a good night's sleep. And getting good sleep is a major part of avoiding and managing burnout. So you want to do what you can to make it as easy as possible to get those anywhere between seven to nine hours of sleep. There's an excellent TED Talk by Matthew Walker called Why, well, he's the author of Why We Sleep. And the TED Talk is called Sleep as Your Superpower. Because that explains why sleep is so important. I'm not going to go into it, but I, I know as somebody who struggles with insomnia, how I'm not the same person when I'm not getting enough sleep. And how this helps to have a wind down where I reduce the lights in my home. So switch off the main lights, maybe just put on side lanterns. You can even get these, they're called biohack tools. Like you can get these special glasses that you wear that are in um, yellow, orange color, as opposed to blue or white that we get off these screens. And then also think about like, if you've got young children that you put to bed, we generally follow a routine, right? And we do the same thing. So they have bath time, pajama time, they maybe have a little snack and then they go to bedtime and maybe there's a lullaby. I'm not suggesting that you sing yourself a lullaby, although some music can help to soothe the nervous system. So don't uh, scratch that off your list. But can you do the same thing at more or less the same time? Like have the same chamomile tea in the same mug and soften the lighting and do five minutes of stretching maybe on the floor next to your bed, then get into bed. Those little patterns that we repeat create something like the Pavlo effect. Where your body's like, oh, I'm winding down and going to sleep now. And definitely think about not having too much coffee, too much alcohol. Um, if you're interested in more detail around how you can improve this time, the autumn, I'm going to share with you where you can get a download of a summary that I've put together, which uh, may be useful if you specifically want some ideas ar around, around this time of day. The one thing that has helped me a lot in many of my clients is to think about using the evenings as a way not just to crash on the couch and watch endless hours of Netflix um, or, the, or the news, but to take your tired heart and to turn it into art. So to find creative projects that you enjoy, even if it's learning something or um, a client said to me yesterday that she wants to design a bucket list. So now she's doing research on all different places and things and experiences that she wants to have. And I thought, what a lovely idea. Um, it's important. That's where the inspiration piece comes from and the curiosity. And if you don't want to learn or do things or being artistic seems like a crazy idea to you, could you spend time in nature at the end of the day, going for maybe, you know, 15, 20 minute walk? If you've got pets, amazing. They're very good for soothing an, um, uh, an anxious or hyper aroused nervous system. Um, and then don't forget about using your other sense, which is hearing. Music can be very, very therapeutic. And what makes it a challenge to wind down is definitely our 
digital devices. There's an excellent documentary available on Netflix called Social Dilemma. Social Dilemma, I, I'd recommend that everybody watches it because it tells you not only why the internet and social media and the news is quite addictive, but also how you can manage it, like not having push notifications to your phone. You always need to choose to go into WhatsApp or into Teams or into Slack or into your Gmail account. Don't let it draw you in because it already does draw you in because of the addictive nature of these devices. And staying off your screens for an hour before you go to bed, if that's at all possible, very helpful. And if you can, put them onto flight mode or use the do not disturb mode. Like my phone switches off by itself at half past nine and comes back on at eight o'clock. Um, and you can easily control that. There's a few apps that I allow to stay on, like Audible and some of my mindfulness apps in case I can't sleep and then I want to use my phone. Although even then, if you are in bed and struggling to fall asleep, um, think about the general temperature in the room because ideally it should not be hot and stuffy. Think about the linen. Right now, if you think of your bedroom, if we were to go there now, does it relax you? Do you like the color? Do you like the linen that you sleep in? Um, is it cluttered or do does it make you happy? Because sometimes just changing your bedroom around a bit and getting new sheets can actually add a lot of inspiration and help us. A lot of people are saying that those heavy weighted blankets are helpful. Um, I find that earplugs just help me feel like I'm in a bit of a cocoon. And if you have sleep apnea, which a lot of us have, then I would look up um, a book called Bre Breathe by James Nestor. And a lot of the breath experts speak about the benefits of breathing through your nose while you sleep. So putting a little bit of micro spore tape on your lips, I do this sometimes. Just to, So it's not a whole duct tape where you can't breathe and you're going to feel suffocated. It's a little bit of um, that thin surgical type tape that holds your lips and your mouth closed so that you breathe through your nose. Try If you've never tried this out and you struggle or you have sleep apnea or you snore, please give this a try because um, a lot of people are saying that it's highly beneficial. And then if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, you won't practice any mindfulness techniques if you haven't practiced them because you won't default to what you haven't practiced. So in the day, in the morning when you wake up, that's when it's a good idea to, to use an app like Headspace or Inside Timer and for 10 minutes practice different techniques or try the, the senses, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, or do the body scan where you relax from your head to your toes and back again. Um, and when you practice these, when it's 1 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning and you know that monkey mind of yours is like jumping all over the show, you actually know what you can do. Um, rather than toss and turn or, or goodness, pick up your phone and start jumping onto Facebook. Not a good idea. In fact, these devices should be out the bed bedroom because you know, you can purchase alarm clocks <laughs> to wake you up. <laughs> and I know a lot of this is easier said than done. I know. I don't get it right. <laughs> and I'm highly motivated, right? And that's why it's important to choose small things and then celebrate those wins when you stick to them. Now, as I mentioned, there's a guide that I've designed, a sleep guide. It's very short on the four senses, which you are welcome to download. I'll share with you at the end where the website is that you can find that. So this is another opportunity for you to reflect on this topic of rest and recharge and specifically sleep using the seasons. Which season, which time of day do you have a longing for more of or to be stronger in? Is it spring, so the beginning of your day, that, that early morning? Is it summer, so bringing in maybe the mindful minutes, using more mindfulness-based grounding exercises, taking the 20-20-20 rule, stopping every hour and stretching, having a 10-minute lunch? Or is it autumn, so transitioning at the end of your workday into your evening and bringing in creativity and helping your tired heart through art or relaxing and being away from screens? Or is it when you're actually in bed and looking at your bedroom and the space and the temperature and the colors and learning techniques that you could use at night? Because you can't do them all. Can't do them all because then you sh you'll set yourself up for failure, not success. So, so which time of day, which season? And what one small thing could you do? Because I don't want you to leave here with 50 ways to take a break. I saw this graphic and I thought, oh, that's great. That's great. I could print that out. And I mean, you could actually. 
you could list all the different things that help you stay inspired, that help you boost and cultivate curiosity or things that manage your energy levels. But um, once again, what I do know is when we try and do too much, we don't do anything. So rather pick one thing and be consistent at that and feel good because we also change most when we feel good, not bad. So catch yourself going to bed half an hour earlier and, and almost give yourself a metaphorical gold star. I mean, I have a client who's giving, every time she has a glass of water, she puts a button into a, into a glass jar and when the glass jar is full, she rewards herself with something special. <laughs> so, you know, extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. And we certainly are living in extraordinary times. So I wanted to to finish with, I say finish because this is almost like opening a new chapter, <laughs> but I know that burnout and energy and feeling tired and stressed is hugely improved when we get the basics right around managing our physical health. So I have a framework that I put together called the Wellculator. Uh, it is what it says. It's, it's a calculation of how well you are, but specifically your physical well-being. So it takes a look at 10 different areas, and we've, we've discussed quite a few of them. So we've discussed point um, 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and, uh, and nine and 10. Yeah, we've looked at sleeping, mindfulness, activating and moving your body and taking breaks from your screen during the day, intentional exercise, like going for a walk. We should be doing half an hour of exercise on most days of the week. And then number 10 is around understanding your personal response to stress. So we spoke about the roses in the vineyards. So knowing what happens in your body when you're physically, mentally, or emotionally stressed. And one of the techniques you can use that seems to benefit almost everybody is deep, slow breathing. But it would be a miss for me to finish this conversation and not at least highlight how important nutrition is. So I'm a dietitian by qualification, so I'm deeply passionate about food. But remember, I'm also French, so I'm a French foodie at heart, which means I'm balanced and joyful around food, which is probably why I could never really be a vegan, because I just like cheese and farm ham, and I've never been quite a, a purist in, in my approach. I do believe that balance is important and enjoyment. So are you eating well? And this is not going to be a nutrition lesson. I'm going to share with you my top tip. So number two on the calculator is, do you eat like an artist? So are you eating lots of color? And by color, I do not mean uh, wine gums or Skittles or M&Ms. By color, I mean nature's fresh produce. So are you eating loads of vegetables and salads and fruits? Why, how, and what you can do. So why this is important? Because those foods give us fiber, they also give us vitamins and minerals that help us have good gut health, and gut health is where your immunity starts. Having a healthy gut helps you have a healthy body and a healthy mind, and fiber is a big part of that. So you want to eat vegetables, salads, and fruits. You want to have at least five tennis ball portions of those foods every day. I personally try and have double that. I actually like vegetables and I find it easy because I'm constantly preparing salads and stir fries and soups and things like that. So if you need inspiration, then stay curious. Remember, we spoke about inspiration, curiosity and energy. These foods give you energy. They don't give you calories, which is great. Um, and you can look online and get healthy, easy recipes. I have a weekly recipe that I send out. It's like five ingredients or less and generally quite colorful. But these are really, really important foods to have. And most of us are not eating enough of them. And if you are already eating enough, outstanding. I celebrate you. Are you having all colors of the rainbow? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Because that's also important. The more variety you have, the better. And then, of course, number four on the calculator is around hydration. So your energy will drop if you're not hydrated. So that's often a quick win. And we should have one glass of water per 10 kilograms that we weigh. So if you're quite petite, you can't see how tall I am, but I'm... I'm quite short. So I would need five or six glasses of water. If you weigh over 100, you might need 10 or 11 glasses of water. And that's over and above regular tea and coffee because those are diuretics. So you don't, you could lose fluid because of that. If you would like the calculator assessment, it is also available with the sleep guide as a download so that you can look through that and check yourself. And where you can find these two downloads, uh, thank you again to Realize Potential. So you can go to the website 
and there'll be an area there where you can download um, and receive the sleep guide as well as the well calculator. You will then have my contact details. And well-being is not the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It is the rainbow. There's no destination. So we all are on this journey together. And I'm here to help you as a well-being partner. So if you want to, you can find me on social media and we can stay connected that way. But I'm hoping that if we never see each other again, that there's something from the time we've spent together. So this is your opportunity as we wrap up to think about what is one thing that you're going to pledge to commit to doing in your life to make this a really good ROI, good return on investment or good return on ingestion because I invited you at the beginning. I showed you my menu to the buffet. <laughs> so we went through um, the well calculator, those 10 different points, looking at how you eat, your hydration, eating like an artist, the importance of sleep and rest. And we looked at the seasons. So maybe that's where you start because your mornings, you know that you could lengthen them and maybe you could do five minutes of some mindfulness exercise. Or perhaps it's the autumn at the end of the day to help you tune out and log and unplug so that you actually can move from the stress response into a neutral centered place and you can heal and rest and find joy in life. Maybe it's something around your sleep or around activating and managing your time or taking screen breaks. What would it be? So if we were sitting together, socially distanced, of course, <laughs> what would your one thing be? Maybe write that down now, put it somewhere in your phone or on a post-it note um, or commit to sharing it with a colleague. You know, there's a strength in this community when we help one another because as I said at the start, if all of this was easy, if this was common, this common knowledge was common practice and it was easy, we would be healthier and happier. We aren't because it isn't. I struggle with this sometimes and I live and breathe this and I'm highly motivated. So together we can rise the tide and a rising tide lifts all boats. So what is your one thing? And be sure to reach out if you need any help. And thank you once again to Realize Potential. It's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure to share this time with you. Stay curious, keep inspired and manage your energy. Remember, ice, inspiration, curiosity and energy. Sante.